This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson, or Adventures in a Desert Island, by Johann David Wyss. Introduction It is very well known that, some years ago, Councillor Horner, a Swiss, made a voyage round the world in the Russian vessel La Podesta, commanded by Captain Krusenstern. They discovered many islands, and amongst others, one very large and fertile, till then unknown to navigators, to the southwest of Java, near the coast of New Guinea. They landed here, and to the great surprise of Mr. Horner, he was received by a family who spoke to him in German. They were a father and mother, and four robust and hardy sons. Their history was very interesting. The father was a Swiss clergyman, who in the revolution of 1798 had lost all his fortune, and had determined to emigrate in order to seek elsewhere the means of supporting his family. He went first to England, with his wife and children, consisting of four sons, between the ages of twelve and five. He there undertook the office of missionary to Otaheite, not that he intended to remain on that uncivilized island, but he wished to proceed from thence to Port Jackson as a free colonist. He invested his little capital in seeds of every description, and some cattle to take out with him. They had a prosperous voyage till they were near the coast of New Guinea, when they were overtaken by a frightful storm. At this period he commenced his journal, which he afterwards committed to the care of Mr. Horner, to be forwarded to his friends in Switzerland. Some time before, a boat from an English vessel, the Adventurer, had visited them, and the father had sent the first part of his journal by Lieutenant Bell to the captain, who remained in the vessel. A violent tempest arose, which continued some days, and drove the Adventurer from the coast. The family concluded the ship was lost, but this was not the case, as will be seen in the conclusion. CHAPTER One. The tempest had raged for six days, and on the seventh seemed to increase. The ship had been so far driven from its course, that no one on board knew where they were. Every one was exhausted with fatigue and watching. The shattered vessel began to leak in many places, the oaths of the sailors were changed to prayers, and each thought only how to save his own life. Children, said I, to my terrified boys, who were clinging round me, God can save us if He will. To Him nothing is impossible. But if He thinks it good to call us to Him, let us not murmur. We shall not be separated. My excellent wife dried her tears, and from that moment became more tranquil. We knelt down to pray for the help of our Heavenly Father, and the fervor and emotion of my innocent boys proved to me that even children can pray and find in prayer consolation and peace. We rose from our knees, strengthened to bear the afflictions that hung over us. Suddenly we heard amid the roaring of the waves the cry of, LAND! LAND! At that moment the ship struck on a rock. The concussion threw us down. We heard a loud cracking, as if the vessel were parting asunder. We felt that we were aground, and heard the captain cry in a tone of despair, "'We are lost! Launch the boats!' These words were a dagger to my heart, and the lamentations of my children were louder than ever. I then recollected myself, and said, "'Courage, my darlings, we are still above water, and the land is near. God helps those who trust in Him. Remain here, and I will endeavour to save us.' I went on deck, and was instantly thrown down, and wet through by a huge sea. A second followed. I struggled boldly with the waves, and succeeded in keeping myself up, when I saw, with terror, the extent of our wretchedness. The shattered vessel was almost in two. The crew had crowded into the boats, and the last sailor was cutting the rope. I cried out, and prayed them to take us with them but my voice was drowned in the roar of the tempest, 
nor could they have returned for us through waves that ran mountains high. All hope from their assistance was lost, but I was consoled by observing that the water did not enter the ship above a certain height. The stern, under which lay the cabin which contained all that was dear to me on earth, was immovably fixed between two rocks. At the same time I observed, towards the south, traces of land, which, though wild and barren, were now the haven of my almost expiring hopes, no longer being able to depend on any human aid. I returned to my family, and endeavoured to appear calm. "'Take courage,' cried I. "'There is yet hope for us. The vessel, in striking between the rocks, is fixed in a position which protects our cabin above the water, and if the wind should settle to-morrow, we may possibly reach the land.' This assurance called my children, and, as usual, they depended on all I told them. They rejoiced that the heaving of the vessel had ceased, as, while it lasted, they were continually thrown against each other. My wife, more accustomed to read my countenance, discovered my uneasiness, and by a sign I explained to her that I had lost all hope. I felt great consolation in seeing that she supported our misfortune with truly Christian resignation. "'Let us take some food,' said she. "'With the body the mind is strengthened. This must be a night of trial.' Night came, and the tempest continued its fury, tearing away the planks from the devoted vessel with a fearful crashing. It appeared absolutely impossible that the boats could have outlived the storm. My wife had prepared some refreshment, of which the children partook with an appetite that we would not feel. The three younger ones retired to their beds, and soon slept soundly. Fritz, the eldest, watched with me. "'I have been considering,' said he, "'how we could save ourselves. If we only had some cork jackets, or bladders, for Mama and my brothers—you and I don't need them—we could then swim to land.' A good thought, said I. I will try during the night to contrive some expedient to secure our safety. We found some small empty barrels in the cabin, which we tied two together with our handkerchiefs, leaving a space between for each child, and fastened this new swimming apparatus under our arms. My wife prepared the same for herself. We then collected some knives, string, tinder-box, and such little necessaries as we could put in our pockets. Thus, in case the vessel should fall to pieces during the night, we hoped we might be enabled to reach land. At length Fritz, overcome with fatigue, lay down and slept with his brothers. My wife and I, too anxious to rest, spent that dreadful night in prayer and in arranging various plans. How gladly we welcomed the light of day shining through an opening! The wind was subsiding, the sky serene, and I watched the sun rise with renewed hope. I called my wife and children on deck. The younger ones were surprised to find we were alone. They inquired what had become of the sailors, and how we should manage the ship alone. Children, said I, one more powerful than man has protected us till now and will still extend a saving arm to us if we do not give way to complaint and despair. Let all hands set to work. Remember that excellent maxim, God helps those who help themselves. Let us all consider what is best to do now. Let us leap into the sea, cried Fritz, and swim to the shore. Very well for you, replied Ernest, who can swim, but we should all be drowned. Would it not be better to construct a raft, and go all together?" "'That might do,' added I, if we were strong enough for such a work, and if a raft was not always so dangerous a conveyance. But away, boys, look about you, and seek for anything that might be useful to us." We all dispersed to different parts of the vessel. For my own part I went to the provision-room, to look after the casks of water and other necessaries of life. My wife visited the livestock and fed them, for they were almost famished. Fritz sought for arms and ammunition. Ernest for the carpenter's tools. Jack had opened the 
captain's cabin, and was immediately thrown down by two large dogs, who leaped on him so roughly that he cried out as if they were going to devour him. However, hunger had rendered them so docile that they licked his hands, and he soon recovered his feet, seized the largest by the ears, and, mounting his back, gravely rode up to me as I was coming from the hold. I could not help laughing. I applauded his courage, but recommended him always to be prudent with animals of that kind, who are often dangerous when hungry. My little troop began to assemble. Fritz had found two fowling pieces, some bags of powder and shot, and some balls in horn flasks. Ernest was loaded with an axe and hammer, a pair of pincers, a large pair of scissors, and an auger showed itself half out of his pocket. Francis had a large box under his arm, from which he eagerly produced what he had called little pointed hooks. His brothers laughed at his prize. Silence, said I. The youngest has made the most valuable addition to our stores. These are fish hooks, and may be more useful for the preservation of our lives than anything this ship contains. However, Fritz and Ernest have not done amiss. For my part, said my wife, I only contribute good news. I have found a cow, an ass, two goats, six sheep, and a sow with young. I have fed them and hope we may preserve them." "'Very well,' said I to my little workman. I am satisfied with all but Master Jack, who, instead of anything useful, has contributed two great eaters, who will do us more harm than good." "'They can help us to hunt when we get to land,' said Jack. Yes, replied I, but can you devise any means of our getting there? It does not seem at all difficult, said the spirited little fellow. Put us each into a great tub, and let us float to shore. I remember sailing capitally that way on Godpapa's great pond. That's a very good idea, Jack. Good counsel may sometimes be given even by a child. Be quick, boys. Give me the saw and auger with some nails. We will see what we can do." I remembered seeing some empty casks in the hold. We went down and found them floating. This gave us less difficulty in getting them upon the lower deck, which was just above the water. They were of strong wood, bound with iron hoops, and exactly suited my purpose. My sons and I therefore began to saw them through the middle. After long labour we had eight tubs all the same height. We refreshed ourselves with wine and biscuit, which we had found in some of the casks. I then contemplated with delight my little squadron of boats ranged in a line, and was surprised that my wife still continued depressed. She looked mournfully on them. "'I can never venture in one of those tubs,' she said. "'Wait a little till my work is finished,' replied I, "'and you will see it is more to be depended on than this broken vessel.' I sought out a long, flexible plank, and arranged eight tubs on it, close to each other, leaving a piece at each end to form a curve upwards, like the keel of a vessel. We then nailed them firmly to the plank, and to each other. We nailed a plank at each side, of the same length as the first, and succeeded in producing a sort of boat, divided into eight compartments in which it did not appear difficult to make a short voyage over a calm sea. But, unluckily, our wonderful vessel proved so heavy that our united efforts could not move it an inch. I sent Fritz to bring me the jack-screw, and in the meantime sawed a thick round pole into pieces. Then, raising the forepart of our work by means of the powerful machine, Fritz placed one of these rollers under it. Ernest was very anxious to know how this small machine could accomplish more than our united strength. I explained to him, as well as I could, the power of the lever of Archimedes, with which he had declared he could move the world if he had but a point to rest it on, and I promised my son to take the machine to pieces when we were on shore, and explain the mode of operation. I then told them that God, to compensate for the weakness of man, have bestowed on him reason, invention, and skill in workmanship. The result of these had produced a science which, under the name of mechanics, 
taught us to increase and extend our limited powers incredibly by the aid of instruments. Jack remarked that the jack screw worked very slowly. "'Better slowly than not at all,' said I. "'It is a principle in mechanics, that what is gained in time is lost in power. The jack is not meant to work rapidly, but to raise heavy weights, and the heavier the weight, the slower the operation. But can you tell me how we can make up for the slowness? Oh, by turning the handle quicker, to be sure. Quite wrong. That would not aid us at all. Patience and reason are the two fairies, by whose potent help I hope to get our boat afloat. I quickly proceeded to tie a strong cord to the after part of it, and the other end to a beam in the ship, which was still firm, leaving it long enough for security. Then, introducing two more rollers underneath, and working with a jack, we succeeded in launching our bark, which passed into the water with such velocity that but for our rope it would have gone out to sea. Unfortunately, it leaned so much on one side that none of the boys would venture into it. I was in despair, when I suddenly remembered it only wanted ballast to keep it in equilibrium. I hastily threw in anything I got hold of that was heavy, and soon had my boat level and ready for occupation. They now contended who should enter first, but I stopped them, reflecting that these restless children might easily capsize our vessel. I remembered that savage nations made use of an outrigger to prevent their canoe oversetting, and this I determined to add to my work. I fixed two portions of a topsail yard one over the prow, the other across the stern, in such a manner that they should not be in the way in pushing off our boat from the wreck. I forced the end of each yard into the bunghole of an empty brandy cask to keep them steady during our progress. It was now necessary to clear the way for our departure. I got into the first tub, and managed to get the boat into the cleft in the ship's side by way of a haven. I then returned and with the axe and saw, cut away right and left all that could obstruct our passage. Then we secured some oars, to be ready for our voyage next day. The day had passed in toil, and we were compelled to spend another night on the wreck, though we knew it might not remain until morning. We took a regular meal, for during the day we had scarcely had time to snatch a morsel of bread and a glass of wine. More composed than on the preceding night, we retired to rest. I took the precaution to fasten the swimming apparatus across the shoulders of my three younger children and my wife, for fear another storm might destroy the vessel and cast us into the sea. I also advised my wife to put on a sailor's dress, as more convenient for her expected toils and trials. She reluctantly consented, and after a short absence, appeared in the dress of a youth who had served as a volunteer in the vessel. She felt very timid and awkward in her new dress, but I showed her the advantage of the change, and at last she was reconciled, and joined in the laughter of the children at her strange disguise. She then got into her hammock, and we enjoyed a pleasant sleep to prepare us for new labours. End of chapter 1